So I've been worrying that I'm going to stand up and trip when I walk on stage. So I didn't do that. So I'm ahead of the game already. Um, welcome and thank you all for coming out in the rain. I know it's uh, there's been a lot of traffic and it's been tough to get here. So my name is Denise Ruffner. Uh, I work for a quantum startup, software startup called Cambridge Quantum Computing. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it later, um, but uh, I do want to say I live in Los Angeles, um, and uh, so it's a pleasure to come here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about quantum computing. What I really want to talk about today is kind of ecosystem and roles and careers, so I'm going to stay away from getting too technical on quantum computing. Um, but I did want to mention this quote from Fortune magazine that perhaps no other emerging technology spans so many different disciplines with so many potential applications. So I think quantum computing is very exciting. Um, it's an exciting place to be and uh, want to talk about just the fact that we know that uh, it has the potential uh, to disrupt all computation that we know today. So I think it's a very important emerging technology um, that all of us need to learn about whether we're in this field or not. Um, so I'm not going to read the slide, but um, I do want to say that uh, interesting point, when quantum computing gets to 300 qubits, it will be able to do more calculations than there are atoms in the universe. So the quantum computing is really going to change the world as we know it. Um, so I, I think that's really what I wanted to point out here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about startups and the startup ecosystem, and this is really important to quantum computing, and you'll see a lot of change. Uh, talk a little bit about Cambridge Quantum. Um, I'm going to talk about what's happening in Singapore in quantum computing, although I'm not the expert. There's some Singaporeans on the panel that can answer more in-depth depth questions. Um, and some trends, a little bit about hardware, and then how, how you could become part of the quantum ecosystem. I want to start off, and if you guys could just raise your hand. Um, are you, uh, if you're part of, if you do quantum computing during the day, it's part of your day job, or do, will you raise your hand? Okay, cool. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm glad you're here. All right. So what's interesting about the quantum computing um, ecosystem is that it's just basically brand new. So when we were in um, January 2018, there were about eight to 10 quantum computing startups. And um, I was working at a different company and we, were, we decided to do a startup program and we were, I mean, we were you know, scouring the earth trying to find anybody that was doing quantum computing. Um, so I've listed some of those eight to 10 that we found. And what's interesting is um, we're now about kind of a year, year and a half later, and there's now well over 100 startups. And I was sitting in the back and met a new one. So there's always more coming. So this is really an area where we're seeing a lot of growth, a lot of new startups, a lot of creativity. And it's just really exciting to look at it. And I'm not going to show you slides, but I do have slides of all the startups in all the different countries. And it's amazing um, to see kind of just how many quantum startups there are. Um, now, there also are, I do want to point out, um, there are starting to be some incubators, just like SG Innovate is an incubator, uh, or kind of an incubator. Kind of, not really an incubator, an investor. Okay, um, but there's Creative Destruction Labs in Canada, which has spun out a lot of quantum startups. And there is an incubator, maybe I'll walk on the other side of the stage for now. There is an incubator starting at University College of London. So there's a, a lot going on in getting quantum technology going. I also hear that Creative Destruction Labs is gonna form um, an incubator in Oxford. So there's. There's a lot going on here. Uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing is actually one of the oldest startups. Um, really interesting story. Our founder, who will speak at SG Innovate later this year, um, was a friend of Stephen Hawking's and was head of the Stephen Hawking Foundation. And Stephen told him in 2013, quantum computing is 
is kind of the future and you need to get into this. And it was based on this conversation with Stephen that our company was started. So we started through the math department um, and an Accelerate Cambridge program in 2015. And uh, currently now we have 85 people, the majority of our scientists. Um, we say that we're global simply because we have offices uh, around the world. Um, we've partnered with the UK government. We have customers in the top 25 companies in the world in various industries. Um, we have a lot of relationships. Um, what our company does is we kind of have two product areas. One is we have a security device, um, which is essentially like a mini quantum computer that operates at room temperature that I can talk about separately. Um, but what we really do is we develop uh, quantum software in a variety of areas. Um, an amazing bench of scientists. Um, and I do want to point out that one of the things that impressed me when I came to the company is we have, a lot, we have not a lot, but we do have a number, I'd say probably six women scientists, which it's, it's not bad. So uh, that's, I was excited to see that. Um, talk about, I just thought I'd throw up some slides about Singapore. As you know, there's the Center of Quantum Technologies here. It's pretty famous, world known. Um, it was started in December of 20, uh, 2007, and there's a lot of training going on there. There's a lot of research, and several quantum tech startups, there's a typo, there should be an S after startup, um, came out of CQT. So that's always a really good resource uh, for all of you. Um, and then uh, with the help of SG Innovate, I have this list of st startups. I think the oldest Singapore startup is Entropica? No? Who is it? It's Horizon, okay. All right, it's Horizon, I stand corrected. Um, but six startups to date in Singapore. Um, if there's any more, let me know, because kind of collect this information. Um, but that's very impressive. Um, and that's a larger number of startups in many countries in the world. So. Um, it shows quite a momentum, um, and, I'm, and I'm very impressed with that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening in startups, what are they all doing. A lot of times, I think, when you look at startups, you're, they're writing software. Um, right now, one of the trends is everybody's coming, not everybody, but a lot of people are coming out with platforms. So uh, it started with one qubit, um, offering a platform called Chemist on materials simulation. Uh, CQC, my company, has a platform called Human on materials and pharmaceutical design. Uh, Ratco out of the UK just introduced a platform for integration of classical and quantum hardware and machine learning. Uh, Zapata has a kind of general use uh, platform called Orchestra they just introduced. And there's quite a number of error correction companies. And I think Q Control is going to be speaking uh, February 12th. So you guys are going to hear more about what Q Control does. So a lot of what we're seeing is people are moving towards a platform to try to make it easier for um, kind of non quantum scientists to be able to use the technology. So we're seeing a lot of that. Then the other thing we're seeing is a number of people are trying to get their software to run on multiple hardware platforms. So Cambridge Quantum has a product called Ticket, which is a software package that allows you to move your algorithms to different manufacturers' devices. Um, IBM has their software development kit called QuizKit, and you can now use QuizKit on the Alpine Quantum Technologies computer. And they talk about showing, moving it to some different platforms. Uh, Xanadu has a Google Circ plugin. And then Strangeworks, who's really operating kind of quietly in beta, they're a company out of Austin, Texas. Um, their goal is to develop software that can run across all platforms. Um, but they're still kind of very quiet, so, uh, but worth taking a look at their website. They have a great user interface. 
The other trend that we're seeing is um, cloud offerings. So mic recently, Microsoft and Amazon have stepped in to the industry, and they're now adding, um, adding quantum computing capabilities to their cloud platforms. And this is really great because a lot of uh, the companies are using their platforms and have all their data on the platform, so now they can use their data to run on a quantum computer without having to migrate their data. So uh, we've seen a lot of interest in uh, the Azure offering as well as the Amazon offering. Um, both IBM, actually, I should have put IBM on this slide. All quantum computers right now are available on the cloud. But um, so Rigetti has their own cloud model. It's consumption-based. Uh, IBM has a subscription model. Um, and I also didn't mention uh, QCWare Forge, but it's the same platform idea that you can go to one place and, and access different quantum computers. Ah, oh, hardware. So I think probably the most exciting thing about quantum computing is that the hardware is still very much in development. And I think that over the next year or five years or 10 years, we're going to see a lot of different entries into the market and different technologies. So the first entries has been superconducting qubits, um, which IBM has done a great job. They announced a 53 qubit device. Uh, Google uh, had a quantum supremacy demonstration also with 53 qubits, which I found was exciting because it brought quantum computing to the front page of every newspaper in the world, and I thought it was just a really great way to get kind of the public and people thinking about quantum computing. But there are other technologies that are emerging. I think in the next year we're going to see um, some ion trap offerings, which are slower but higher fidelity, uh, photonic quantum computing, I think we all read about Cy Quantum, who just had a tremendous funding round, which I think is promising. And then there's other technologies going on. So a uh, lot to be looking out for as we see quantum hardware develop. Um, and the keys to a good quantum computer, again, is high fidelity qubits. They're scalable. And the, that you can maximize the effectiveness of algorithms. Um, basically, there is um, a measurement device. It's very hard to compare quantum computers. IBM has a, a measurement called quantum volume, which is used to kind of normalize a quantum computer so you can compare them because it's not enough to just say, mine has 20 qubits, this other one has 24, so it's better. Uh, there's a lot more to it. So one of the ways to compare qu uh, quantum computers is through this quantum volume measurement. And I know, I think that's the only measurement that I've seen or model that I've seen proposed to compare quantum computers. Um, all right. So where are we today on the qubit count? So I'm not addressing error, but um, IBM has a 53 qubit device that I mentioned that people can access on the cloud if you subscribe to the IBM Q network. Um, they just released uh, a quantum volume computer with a, uh, with a 32 quantum volume. It's a 28 qubit device. And Google has demonstrated quantum supremacy, but we can't access that computer yet. And then Rigetti has 16 qubits and is promising 128. So we're waiting to see what's, what Rigetti's going to do. So I predict in the next year we're going to see improvements from all of these above players and, and kind of the, the other vendors that I mentioned on the previous slide. I think there's a lot of activity and a lot of development going on in, uh, in this technology. And this is kind of where the excitement is. Now, just to compare, just for the heck of it, um, I thought I'd show you a picture of Summit which is the most powerful supercomputer uh, today. And it costs $200 million. There's a great picture of it. Um, if you look at it, it burns quite a bit of electricity. It's the size of two basketball courts. Um, and I, I love this quote that to build a computer 30 times as powerful would cost a billion dollars and would require a nuclear power plant to run it. So. <laughs> 
So it kind of shows you that, that this technology is great, it's always going to be useful, but there are some limits that it's hitting. And if you think about it um, and do the math, and I check this out with the experts, a single quantum computer, and this is a fault tolerant quantum computer with 50 or 60 qubits would be more powerful than this. So that's the potential of quantum computing is uh, it, it's really hard to keep on expanding in this way and this new technology really gives you some flexibility and some um, added benefits. Okay, so how to become part of the quantum computing ecosystem. Um, what I wanted to talk about is there's a lot of different roles in the quantum computing e ecosystem. And I think a lot of people that talk to me and say, oh, you're in quantum computing. I'm not a quantum computing scientist. I can't be in that industry. And I would just tell you that um, I think each of us has our own set of skills that we can bring if we choose to. And um, I, so what I tried to do is just list a bunch of different roles um, that people have when they're involved in a quantum computing startup. So I come from a sales and marketing background. I, I did go to graduate school in science, but um, what I bring to my company is sales and marketing, where on the panel we have technical people. So there's, there's a contrast in the different roles that you can have in this. And all of our companies are looking for people with these skills. So whether you're in marketing or whether you're in PR or whether you're a salesperson or good at hardware, there's a lot of different roles available. And so, you know, what I would say if you're interested in quantum computing, kind of ask those questions like what you can bring to it because there is a lot of opportunity and it, it's not just for the quantum physicist. Um, and just to be thorough, some different areas of education used in quantum computing. AI, chemistry, computer science, materials, math, philosophy, physics, finance. So there's, there's a lot of different um, education paths that people will take to get to quantum computing. And I think that's going to be an interesting question for you to ask the panelists, kind of how, how did you get there based on where you went to school? Um, and, and why did you go to quantum cu computing or what attracted you to this area? And then finally, I wanted to say there's a lot of resources for learning quantum computing. So if you do want to get into this in more depth, um, there's some really great edX courses. There's a new edX course on, uh, I think, quantum AI. It's, I think, $79 to take. It's really inexpensive. Um, MIT has a famous series of courses. A lot of people do Python uh, programming courses or go to quantum hackathons to learn quantum. Um, and then there's a ton of books. And I uh, have a joke here in the middle. Uh, one of my favorite books is Quantum Computing for Babies. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a child's book. It's really cute. Um, but there also is, uh, we just, just recently published um, from the book authority is a list of like the top 13 quantum computing books. So it's worth taking a look at that if you want to get a book on quantum computing. And then also uh, Terry Rudolph has a great book, Q for Quantum. And then uh, from Bob Suter from IBM who speaks quite a lot publicly also has just recently written a book. So there's a lot out there. Um, if you, you want to read a book and learn more about it, I really encourage you to to try something. Um, it's, uh, it's actually interesting. So it's fun and interesting, a little bit of math sometimes. And um, I think this is the way that if you choose to migrate towards a quantum career, you can use a lot of these tools to just help you gain a better understanding. So I, that's all I wanted to say. OK. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to invite Denise to take a seat and would our panel please come up to on stage? Yes. Okay. 
in any way you're comfortable with. a little bit more random, right? <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Juliana, the head of talent networking here at SG Innovate. First of all, welcome to our space. Welcome to our office. We're very happy to have you with us this afternoon with our lovely panel here. Um, and uh, just now when Denise asked the question as to how many of you work on quantum computing, I believe not many people raise their hands. So I'm a little bit curious, who are the people we have sitting in front of us? I don't know about you guys, but I am. So how many of you are working in a startup? Raise your hands, please. Okay, how many in the corporate? Academic? A couple, all right. How many of people here are looking for a job? Okay, how many people here are looking for talent? Nobody. <laughs> okay, the people who are looking for jobs, notice the people looking for talent and go and talk to them after the session. I mean, that's what we are here for, right? This is an event where we want to mix and mingle. And I like what Denise shared during her presentation as well about how CQC started based on a conversation, a discussion. And I think that I've always wanted, or I like panels where it's a discussion between panel members as well as the audience participation. So don't be shy, don't take it like a Singapore Q&A type thing. You ask a question and we answer because we are not here to answer your questions. We are here to have a dialogue. We are here to uh, go through this very interesting topic around quantum technologies and talent. And I think the idea about the, the lack of talent diversity, the types of talent that we need in this space keeps coming up. So I would like to you know, get the panel first and foremost to introduce themselves. You guys know Denise already quite well. So maybe Priyanka, you can start. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Priyanka. I am a data science. And my primary job is to run the AI computer functions for supply chain. Uh, but my extended job is to talk about quantum technology and talk about what, how quantum technology is going to change the world. Uh, I'm Yvonne. I'm currently a scientist at A-Star. Uh, I come from a quantum computing hardware background, actually building the nuts and bolts for quantum computers in the future, uh, for the future. Uh, and uh, I will be moving to NUS uh, f later this year to start a experimental group in this area and actually build quantum hardware uh, in an academic setting. Um, hello everyone, my name is Tommaso. I used to be a postdoc research fellow at CQT. I was working in the, I was working mostly on theory of quantum computing and quantum information and today I'm the CEO and co-founder of Entropica Labs, which is one of the startups that Denise mentioned during her presentation. So we are based here in Singapore and what we are working on is to bring together a team of talents, so again this idea of talents, um, to work on how how can we enable machine learning, or maybe I should say quantum machine learning, which really means machine learning boosted by quantum technologies, um, how can we enable it, making it accessible, and also make it useful for the general public? So Denise shared about her idea of you know, the possibilities in the future with regards to quantum technologies. I'm curious to hear from the other panel members, uh, where do you see the position of Singapore in light of what's happening around the world? So our panel is going to be relaxed, uh, we're just going to talk amongst ourselves, but anytime you guys want to say something, you disagree wholeheartedly with us, you feel like we're talking nonsense, or you totally agree with us, and you want to say that we are right, just shout it out, uh huh? Okay, I can start. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm not, I'm not from Singapore, although I've been living in Singapore for about six years now. Um, we took a very clear decision to be based in Singapore. I think it's an extremely exciting place to be. I love the fact that we are really working hard to create a quantum computing community, which is maybe the first big step to be taken if we want to make the technology real here. Um, I do think Singapore can and must play a huge role in the quantum computing industry in the future. Um, I mean, we have incredible hardware talents like Yvonne. Uh, we try to do our best on the software side of things. But at the same time, I think Singapore is a very unique role or can play a very unique role because 
even at the academic level with the presence of the Center for Quantum Technologies and other research group across the universities, we have in-house, like a powerhouse to generate and, you know, and really push forward talents from academia to the, to, to the startup or company, or let me say industrial world, which is very unique. There are not many cities or countries in the world that can really claim something like that. So even if Singapore is small, and sometimes it feels overwhelming when you try to compete with like the US or China, I remain convinced that we, we must compete with them, both on the talent and on the software and on the hardware level. So I find this is an incredibly exciting place to be and like, I, I can say I'm really proud that we can play our small part as well. Um, and just to add on, I think one uh, advantage that Singapore has is that we have a lot of good engineers. Um, and I think quantum computing is slowly transitioning from you know, a playground for just physicists uh, to something that involves a lot more interdisciplinary research efforts and team building, uh, team efforts to build this hardware and, and the software aspects together. So, um, so personally for me, I came back to Singapore after my PhD in the United States a year and a half ago, and I've been really impressed by the uh, you know, number of really uh, talented engineers that we have in the country and just you know, all the, being in a small country in this case actually helps because everybody's just one short taxi ride away. Um, and I think if we have, if we find a way to bring all those different disciplines together, uh, we can really have something that's very unique and powerful in the Singapore community uh, to contribute to the global quantum landscape. Um, I think also, and I don't want to speak for the government, but I think the government is very supportive of quantum computing. And I think that's really important. I think the government has made a strong statement that's yeah. very positive. Uh, Maybe we can talk about that. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. Thanks for the prompt. Uh, actually, uh, I, I am really proud of the, the commitment from the government, both from the in, a, in an academic point of view as well as the uh, commercial, the startup uh, domain. So we have several really good startups, really promising startups, uh, funded. Uh, I think some of them, quite a few of them, are funded by SG Innovate and uh, uh, and various other investors. And the academics on the academic side, we have the Center for Quantum Technology, which is supported by uh, NRF and MOE and uh, all these government organizations. Um, we also have the NRF, which is the National Research Foundation, that's actively developing the field of quantum technology. So there are thematic fundings being given, uh, being distributed in this area to encourage more uh, collaborative research, uh, more prototyping of this technology within the Singapore uh, ecosystem. I have been in Singapore for a long period of time, as long as 20 years, and I have seen the technological shifts. And one of the things that I find very uniquely about Singapore is that it has been very visionary when it comes to emerging technologies and adoption of technology and also bringing it mainstream. If you look at some of the initiative at a national level, Smart Nation, this is where um, Singapore brings about emerging technologies to be mainstream. And it is not just bringing the technologies mainstream, but they focus a lot on the ecosystem development. And when we talk about ecosystem, um, you talked about startups, education, talent pool, talent pipeline, attracting the foreign talents in case if there is a shortage. And lastly, but very importantly, lining up the corporate placement opportunities. So as you have um, the talent coming out of either university or talent coming into the country, you have opportunities. So that's where I see that Singapore as a country plays a very important role and also looks at the holistic uh, view of bringing in the technology and bringing it mainstream into the commercial space. Okay, so let's tackle the, the main problem that we are here to discuss today, which is the lack of talent. Now, I think I want to approach it in two ways. One is the diversity, meaning the types of experiences and knowledge and skill sets that people need to bring when they're joining a company. So not just in terms of gender diversity, but a lot of times, a lot of skills in terms of thinking, etc. And then, of course, there's the gender aspect, because I was talking to a friend at 11 yesterday, and he was commenting that in the AI community, only about 18% are women. And I suspect this is a statistic that is quite general across, uh, across all the you know, tech companies. 
Um, so I'm curious to tackle the issue from these two standpoints, one in terms of the type of roles or the, the expertise that we need to bring in, the level of people that we need to bring in, and the other one is on the gender aspect. So we were discussing a little bit amongst ourselves before this conversation started. Um, so guys, continue. Lah. Who wants to start? Well, I'll, I'll start with a comment that um, CQC has grown to 85 people, and we're, we've been a research company, and now we're at an inflection point, and we're trying to transition into being, I don't know, a real company. And so what we're doing is we're looking for all the kind of normal roles like a CFO or a COO or a marketing person or salespeople. So, you know, it's a startup. So it's, it's simply kind of the mindset of, are you interested in going to a startup? Are you comfortable with being in a new technology area? But there's a, there's a lot of opportunities um, in this ecosystem. Uh, beyond just a scientist. Well, I guess I can talk a little bit about gender diversity. Um, since I, I was a physicist from undergraduate through to PhD, and I work in this field, that's, I guess, it's true that it's quite uh, predominantly Mm, I think it's it's there are, we're definitely a minority, but I you know personally I haven't felt that um, it was a hostile environment in any sense. So uh, very often I hear questions uh, from girls who are interested in this area. Their concern is that since there are so few women, does that imply that it's harder in terms of the content as well in, as well in terms of the environment? Um, and I think this is really a chicken egg problem. Um, it, because we don't have enough women to start with, that seems intimidating. And, and then as a result, we uh, you know, potential applicants turn away, um, and that just becomes a very vicious cycle. Um, so what I would say in terms of encouraging more girls or more women to you know, be part of the community is really, if you have concerns like this, talk to one of us, um, and we'll be able to give you a more clear, pic uh, you know, a more realistic picture of what's actually happening rather than just a superficial uh, picture that we may get from the outside that seems like everybody involved is, is, is a man um, that seems intimidating. Um, but you know, in fact, it's actually a really welcoming environment and it's very exciting. There are different roles that you can take take up and uh, different ways to participate. So, uh, so it's really just about maybe stepping through that superficial barrier of perceived uh, gender bias and actually take a chance to uh, take the initiative to maybe uh, put yourself out there a little bit more. Um, and of course, as a field, we could do better as well by doing better outreach and talking more, having more conversations about this issue. So I completely agree with you uh, when it comes to quantum. I think the general perception is that it's only for the, it's a field which is only for the physicists. And Dennis covered it very well that uh, on her charts that it's not just the researchers, not just the physicists that we are looking at in this space, but there's much, many more opportunities. Um, we have seen with a lot of technologies that uh, we focus just on the technology or the technical aspect of it. But if you go to the industry, um, a very important aspect is to understand the domain, and this is where the domain knowledge is very important. Understanding what the business problems are and converge that with technology on how it is going to solve the business problem. And this is where the different roles start to evolve and emerge, right? On the gender bias, yes, we have, so we have been talking about first, uh, I'll talk about the superset, which is women in technology, and then we talk about women in AI, and now we are talking about women in quantum, of course. Um, and um, there are various research and studies that are done over um, then how is the gender diversity in this space. And there are a few studies that have caught my attention. Um, so first of all, we see a lot of articles, very inspiring articles, the 12 leaders that you should know, 12 women leaders that you should know in the space of physics, or 19 leaders who have changed the world of quantum computing. So these articles have been published, but the fact is that um, there is a huge gap when it comes to gender diversity. Uh, there was a research study that was done which talks about that if we have to bring women within the 5% parity of uh, men in terms of uh, equality within uh, the uh, quantum space, 
it would take 258 years, the rate and pace at which we are growing today. So yes, it is an important issue to address, and I think the first step is to really get over that uh, perception and a barrier that this is an area which is only and only for the physicist. Okay, so at this point, just curious, any questions, burning questions out there from the floor? Please raise your hand. Yes. Uh, thank you. So my question is, when you're hiring for the non-data science roles, do you look for people who already have some uh, understanding of quantum, like say you're hiring for a marketing or salesperson, does that person need to understand quantum in order to work in a quantum company? Well, since I've, I'm hiring a lot, um, I'll answer that. Um, what I look for is someone that has done their homework before the interview and uh, may not understand it, may, or may not be the expert, but shows the interest. And so that's really, for me, the starting point. Um, I have interviewed people who've said, oh, what's quantum? And uh, that's, you know, I, so I, I would tell anybody, and I think we all agree that before you do an interview, you do some homework, so you can uh, try to make a few intelligent comments. Um, but it's not, uh, I don't think that the industry is at a point where we would give a quiz on quantum and you know the top 10% would be hired. It's just not there. So everybody has a learning curve they go through and we really try to support um, our teams through that learning curve. Um, so I, I tend to think about what you ask about, uh, about that a little bit differently. So what is really important for me and I guess it goes back to what Denise is saying, is really asking, you know, I'm always curious, and the first thing I ask to people when they come for an interview is why are you here, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you might be an expert in quantum computing, maybe you're not an expert in quantum computing, but it seems to me that that remains, is important, but is a bit superficial compared to why are you actually there in front of me? Like, why did you take the time to come and have a chat with us? If you are able to, you know, to convince me that there is more than just expertise. Or let, let me say differently, expertise is cheap. Everyone can be an expert in something. Like, it's not difficult to be an expert. You enroll in a university, you become an expert. That doesn't mean anything. It means something, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna be, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be the right person for whatever we want to do. So what I personally find extremely important, maybe fundamental is, what are your motivations and whether you're a curious person or not? Because if you're not curious, if you don't have curiosity driving you forward, you're not going to go anywhere. Especially in a place like a startup where you, know, you have to be able to adapt very quickly, you need to take decisions, you need to, you need to move the world forward by yourself. So it often, you know, this question comes back all the time, right? Do people have to be experts to work in quantum computing, blah, blah, blah. Sure, it helps. It certainly helps, but it's not really only about that. It's mostly about your motivations or whether you're able to learn. If you can learn, it doesn't matter. You can become an expert of anything you want given enough time. And that, either you have it or you don't have it. There's no degree. So I'll totally agree with Tommaso on this. Being the head of talent networking, I know what I'm talking about. So I meet a lot of people all day long, 20 over years, okay? And you meet all kinds of people. And I think the motivation is very important. Half the time, I think people don't even know what they want. They need to figure out amongst themselves. They need to figure out for themselves what exactly are their interests. If they're going to take direction from government, their parents or somebody, their friends, as to what are the future jobs out there without knowing what's their strengths, what their weaknesses are, what their interest lies in, they're bound for failure because you don't know what's the job of the future going to be like. And if you're just studying because you think that's going to be the job that's going to secure you to pay for the housing loan, etc., etc., you're sadly mistaken. So that's why I think that it is important to have a lot of self-reflection and know exactly what your passions are, what your motivations are, and strive to that. Like what Denise pointed out, you'll be surprised the number of people that come to interviews that are not prepared. They don't know what the company does. They have no idea what a startup does, which is why I think for talent, we do have a program called Summation that we offer to folks who aren't exactly sure. They are in technical areas, but they're not exactly sure if the startup is for them and they work for startups like, you know, Tomasos, 
um, to see whether this is an area where they like to be in and they want to contribute to be in uh, after they finish their studies. So I think things like that where you explore on your own self-motivation, finding out for yourself what actually makes you take, what makes you interested in getting out of your bed every morning and doing that rather than following what our government tells you or what your teachers tell you, what your parents tell you. Um, yeah, there was another question. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sure. I, I just would like to add a comment, which, which I think is quite um, important, independently whether we're speaking about quantum computing or any other technology or expertise. So what often happens is that people tend to hire people who they feel comfortable with. And these are people who are very similar to, to themselves, right? So I could easily do the same. I only hire people who have a PhD in quantum information, and then we all sit in the room together, we all think exactly the same, we're all happy, uh, which is as good as like buying a bunch of mirrors and just talking to myself. <laughs> this is okay, but it's not maybe the best way you can spend your time. So the way I think about it is if you can walk in the room and surprise me or just you know, we can have an interview at the end of the hour, I go home and like, okay, I learned something I didn't know before. It doesn't have to be about quantum computing, but if you, if you can, you know, I think as a, if we want to create a team, you want to create a team where people have ideas that are different from yours. Otherwise, you just create uh, like a resonance and you don't really move forward. You want people who challenge you, you want people who bring different perspectives, and that is, again, way more important than what your degree says. Totally agree, but very hard to manage that group of people. So you all need to be very good bosses. I have my. Uh, we are at a venue where I noticed EF, and uh, the founder of EF has a view that some of the new technologies will be constrained by the national silos. Uh, so quantum computing, for example, may have applications in cryptography where they would have non-civilian users. So unlike classical computer where you had free flow of capital and technologies across the world, do you think quantum would be restricted in its growth by the fact that it could have applications which would have non-civilian users or because of what's happening around the world that it restricts the availability of talent, the availability of technologies, so you essentially have uh, nationalistic or uh, development of quantum within a national domain rather than uh, across a global scale, like we saw in classical. It's a, it's a really good question. Uh, it was asked to me by a very smart investor. So you're the second person who asked this question. I, usually people don't really think about it. Um, I don't think so. It's, it's hard. It's really like today, let me say differently. So unfortunately, the word quantum makes people either uncomfortable or too excited. You say, oh, quantum. But at the end of the day, it's computing, right? It's a different paradigm of, com of computation. It's more powerful, maybe, for certain applications. But it's still computing. It's hard. It's really, I, I believe it's really hard to, to control computing access, especially in a world where most of what we know about quantum computing today is a direct consequence of academic research, which means that you can go home, open your laptop, and read everything you need to know about quantum computing. How do you control that flow inf of information? You can't. Y you really can't. It's very different from what happened, for example, in the 40s and the 50s with like the beginning of computing and especially the atomic bomb program, where you could control it because there was no internet. A and even at the time, it was really hard to control, by the way even without the technology that we have available today. So I do agree the governments certainly would want to control the technology. To an extent, they can. Maybe there are, you know, um, very particular research programs that we don't know about. But in practice, I just find it very, very hard to imagine a scenario where you cannot access quantum computers, you know, across borders. Why would you want to do that? I mean, maybe Priyanka can say a bit more about the perspective of IBM because it's part of their business model. But as a startup, or forget about the startup, even just as a, somebody who uses a quantum computer, I think it's technically, practically impossible to control it. I would agree with that. And then um, the fact that uh, the major players, and I'll start with the IBM, uh, that IBM has made quantum computer available on the cloud, um, I think that says it all. Then the intent and the effort is to make it available to the masses so that it can help the organization 
to think about that how, what are the application, potential application of these technologies. Um, it can help people to invest time in terms of learning and growing the talent. Um, so yes, uh, it is going to be beyond the silos of national or certain domains and applicable across industries. Right. And I just want to make a statement that uh, it took, uh, when we look at classical computers, uh, it took 50 years for classical computers to reach cloud, but if we look at uh, quantum, within a period of, short period of six years, it was out from research to cloud. Yeah, I think the the having access to quantum hardware over the cloud is, is extremely beneficial for people to learn and grow. Um, and I think I just want to add on to that, that you know when we say quantum, it's actually a really broad field that includes communication, sensing, cryptography, computing, and all sorts of new things that we may develop in the in years to come. So it is possible that a very small part of it will be some sort of national security issue and might be controlled. Um, but I think in general, uh, very many aspects of quantum technologies will be, will be actually non-national security related and it will actually be a commercial technology um, that will be accessible you know, globally uh, through many different potential forms of business models, whatnot. Um, and that's not, that's actually quite similar to many other technologies. Uh, one, you know, we already have expo export control on so many products and, and parts. Uh, so it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be something that's completely new that we'll have no idea how to deal with. So you will be parts of it that will have to think of new models and new policies, but majority of it, I believe, will still be uh, available and accessible for majority of the population globally. Oh, hi. Um, hi, hi there. So thanks for this. Um, I, my question is not about hiring, so sorry if this is off topic. Um, but I was wondering, so if we were to succeed and if we were to get to a state of quantum supremacy, what would, the, what would be the applications that, would, that you're most excited about and what would keep you up at night? Oh gosh, the applications that I'm most excited about. Boy, I'd have to think about this for a second. Um, I think that I think what I think about is uh, application of new materials or development of new materials. Um, recently, we've been working with some very imaginative customers that have been kind of giving us challenges that I never even thought of, um, and so the ability to really do some innovation um, in, let's say, manufacturing or in uh, 3D printing or in some different areas, I think that really excites me. Um, yeah. I don't know what the second part of the question was. What was the second part of the question? What would keep me up at night? Uh, what would keep me up at night? Um, Right now, not much. I think it's I, jet lag. Yeah, jet lag keeps me up. But um, I, I think it's exciting, and I, I love the way that many people look at the same at quantum computing and what problems they want to solve with it and that variety. So I just find it kind of endlessly interesting, and it's, it's not keeping me up at night yet. For me, it would be two areas which I would be really excited about. One would be health, so new drug discovery and making um, drugs available or new medicines available at a much more commercially viable as well as faster pace. Um, I mean, every day we read in newspapers about new virus coming out and um, the, the big, big wigs in the medical field haven't really kind of experimented with those kind of drugs. So the turnaround for coming up with new drugs and new drug discoveries, that would be one. And second is um, extension of what Denny said in terms of material, material discovery, but in a more eco-friendly way. We're dealing with a lot of challenges and problems related to the environment. So if we are, if we are able to come up with materials in a much more eco-friendly way, I think that I would be passionate about. And what would keep me awake at night? I don't really think so. <laughs> I think I would be, 
I would be awake at night, but yeah, um, I mean, since we are talking so much about gender diversity, yeah, that would be one of the things that, it, that would eventually keep me awake. Start hiring. Hiring? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not hiring right now. <laughs> um, yeah, nice one. So, okay, I'm a physicist, which I guess allows me to, like, um, make fun of other physicists. So it, it's, it's, quite, it's, quite <laughs> it's quite funny, right? Because physicists sometimes, have, uh, sometimes are a bit arrogant, and this is an euphemism. Um, if you see what happened in quantum computing, now it's changing. So now I think people are starting to look at a much broader picture, especially because uh, you know experts from outside the community are starting to come in and add ideas and new, you know, new projects or whatever. But especially in the 90s, or in the 80s and in the 90s where quantum computing was still a very nascent phase, people were saying, oh yeah, we can like break cryptographic protocols, we can simulate physics, we can simulate materials, and then you go back to the 40s and the 50s and physicists build, well, not physicists, people build the first computers, and they were saying, oh yeah, we can break cryptographic codes, we can simulate physics, we can simulate new materials, and it's just striking how it is exactly the same. It was exactly the same. There, and, and at the beginning of quantum computing, what I think is super exciting about what we will be able to do is really thinking about machine learning and working towards what people call um, general artificial intelligence. So one of the big problems with simulating the brain is that the brain is incredibly complex. And if you want to reach that level of complexity with a, let me say a traditional computer is just something that we have not learned how to do yet. That doesn't mean that we will learn how to do it using a quantum computer, but at least the intrinsic structure of what quantum computing allows you to do is in some sense similar to the structure that the brain has. Extremely correlated, very complex, um, quite large computational space. I find that incredibly exciting. What I find even more exciting is the fact that quantum computing is based on a paradigm which is very different from conventional computing. It's based on the laws of physics. What we all do, because we don't live in the quantum world, <coughs> but we live in a classical world, we take problems we are very familiar with and we try to squeeze them in a quantum computer and see what happens, which is fair. What is going to be very interesting is um, finding completely new applications of quantum computing that are fully based on quantum ideas and quantum, uh, on the quantum paradigm, and we really don't know anything about that. We, we haven't even started to scratch at the surface of what you can do if you have quantum devices in your hands. Why? Because we didn't have them. But today we do, and in the same way as people started to find all sort of applications for classical computers, like Google Maps, which is something that we give for granted. But, you know, before Google Maps, nobody thought of Google Maps, and now it's like, yeah, sure, Google Maps, but that wasn't a thing before. In the same way, we will find new applications simply because we can use the machines. That is exciting. Um, yeah, and I will just piggyback on that last point, that I think right now a lot of us were still uh, the science itself, the discovery itself is actually the process of building the quantum computer. But hopefully, I think what I find really exciting is that if we do our job and we have more people contributing to this and we can get to the stage where we have functional quantum computers, that's when you can actually use, actually that becomes a means to new technologies. And honestly, I don't think I'm, I might not be the most imaginative person, so I'm really excited for people to, you know, domain expertise outside physics to, to just use that to develop something amazing and useful. Um, so I can't, you know, like, I, I think it's, it's something that physicists can dream up, but uh, what's more meaningful will be actually people with problems that can be solved when they have such a machine uh, and domain expertise from a variety of different disciplines to come together and really think about what they can do with a functional quantum computer. So when that day comes, then the building the computer is no longer the science part the computer itself will be starting to develop new science. So that's something I find really exciting for this field. Oh, uh, what scares me, so I'm a hardware person, so it sounds, sounds quite glamorous. I'm a quantum experimental quantum physicist, but majority of my job is basically plumbing. Uh, so basically a broken pipe on my fridge will be, on my dilution refrigerator would be a nightmare that will literally wake me up and make me run to the lab. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yes. 
So I'll tackle the what keeps me up at night because a lot of things keep me up at night, especially whatever the panel said. So really, all this talk about quantum and the space of change and the applications like technology, I'm just curious how much of the human of us, right, has evolved as fast as our, as our technology has in terms of, you know, the, um, whether some of the things that we are doing is ethically right, right? So these are the questions that keep me up at night. You talked about medicine discovery. I'm an economist and I know money makes the world go round. So, end of the day, who's going to pay for all these drugs? People who are damn bloody rich. So what happens to the people who don't have the money, the people who don't have the resources? That keeps me up at night. And the last point is my poor baby, my daughter. You know, the, in the future, right, I really no clue how she's going to survive with this constant speed of information that's just thrown at her, this rate of pace in terms of the technology, um, whether or not she's able to stand on two feet and think for herself and not be replaced by a computer somewhere, some, you know, yeah, some two, I don't know what, how many, 100 million, billion dollar computer is it? Yeah. So things like that, I think um, there's a lot of advancement in technology, I agree. But there are also discussions that I think as human beings, we need to take amongst ourselves and question, are these always good? Which is why we have the Nobel Peace Prize, right? Because somebody's famous invention caused a lot of problems after that. Yeah, so um, next question, please. Oh, so many. Let me show you. Maybe the gentleman in front. Hi, my name is Klaus Nemso. Um, I joined a shipping company three months ago as chief innovation officer. And before that, I worked in oil and gas. And for me, one of the interesting challenges, huge challenges and opportunities is, and I'm curious on your views, is bridging between the com quantum community, which is sort of solutions looking for problems, and different industries. And I can see you mentioned pharma and chemical industries and even oil and gas and financial services are much more sophisticated, I think, in exploring the opportunities and where you can use quantum technology. Now, being full-time in the shipping and maritime industry, I see that you know, there is a huge gap between understanding of what these technologies can do and applying that. Yet 80 to 90% of all the goods in the world are shipped on ships, our contributions to carbon emissions we're looking at. Uh, the ship manufacturing is probably in interesting areas, but somehow I see, I'm wondering what's, what, how could you bridge that gap and where would you see applications in the shipping and in maritime industry, but how could you have sort of a process that, that gets us to connect these, these things a bit better? Thank you for the question. Anybody on the panel would like to answer that? Thank you. Um, so Klaus, that's a really great question. Um, and I think what's really been exciting for me lately is um, there's kind of some standard industries that people use when they talk about quantum, which would be finance or chemistry or um, let's say machine learning and th th that are really common. And what's been happening with um, my company lately is we're getting a lot of phone calls from people like the shipping industry or like other industries which I can't, well, I'll say one of them, a cereal company called us. Um, so we're getting a lot of people that are starting to really think out of the box and say, hi, I'm a chief of technology. I hear that quantum is coming. Would you come in and would you talk to me and could we spend an hour or two just, you know, batting around ideas? Because even though I'm not finance, machine learning or chemistry, I think there are some areas that quantum might be able to help me, but I don't know enough about it. And we're having a lot of these discussions lately and it's, uh, it's really kind of fun because the problem sets and what they're trying to do is so different than what we've really been thinking about for the last couple years. So um, I actually have an email with a list of some things for you, mm -hmm. um, but uh, probably I would say optimization or looking at supply chain is, is a real obvious one. Um, but kind of like Tommaso said, I think part of the fun is kind of getting in a room and batting around ideas and seeing what you come up with because um, it's easy to kind of resort to standard solutions and what's really fun about the technology is kind of really challenging ourselves. 
Mm, I, I think that is a, a very good answer. Uh, we, we as a company love optimization problems. So optimization problems are this subset, maybe, uh, depends on the definition of machine learning, but everyone looks at machine learning because it's fashionable, and there is this incredible class of mathematical problems. They're usually hard combinatorial problems um, that people face, especially in more traditional industries, like manufacturing, um, shipping, and maybe in, in some other degree also in finance um, and so on. But op uh, optimization problems are really hard. They're usually difficult to parallelize, like especially when people today think about machine learning, what they're really thinking is a problem that you can easily parallelize across GPUs or something like that. Um, if the problem doesn't have that intrinsic structure, then it becomes hard to solve it with a classical computer, especially a conventional computer, especially when you have a very large number of parameters, as you usually do in shipping. This is where quantum computers potentially can really play a major role. The, pr the, the big issue with optimization problems is that they're hard. They're hard conceptually, they're hard mathematically, they do require um, domain expertise, and then what you usually have is this very interesting gap between the, you know, the company that wants to solve something very hard, but they don't really know how to speak the mathematical language, and you know, the, the like, how can I say, the, the brave startup that is trying to change the world and, like, very quickly, and they find it sometimes hard to understand the application or the, the fine details that are usually very domain specific. So back to your question, how do you, how do you bridge the gap? I don't have a magic answer to that. I really think the exciting part, going back to Denise's point, is people need, really need to start talking to each other. Physicists are bad at that because you know, they, they're like, oh yeah, we know everything, which is true, on a piece of paper you do know everything. But then when you try to <laughs> translate that knowledge into industrial problems, it's hard, which is fair, and this is why I'm super happy to see more startups uh, coming out and say, okay, well, we start to get a good sense of what the technology can do, what the technology is going to be in the next five, 10, whatever years. Let's talk to people who have the real problems. Let's not guess, let's not look at what papers tell you a quantum computer can do. No, talk to the people and really work together with them to bridge that gap between the technology and the applications. So I'll straight away come to your question on how do we bridge the gap and I'll give you an IBM view of it. Um, there has been a lot of focus in terms of ecosystem development. Um, so on one side, there's a huge effort and focus and investments that are going into research of the quantum computing. But on the other side, IBM is also partnering with the industry um, in terms of defining the use cases, brainstorming the ideas, understanding what your problems are and how those problems, how do you think, or why do you think those prob problems can't be solved by the classical computers or supercomputers today? So having that brainstorming session picking up from what Denise said and getting you know, the organization to be a little more aware of what quantum technology is and get people to start thinking and coming up with ideas, I think that's the first step towards bridging that gap. Yeah, but that's in terms of patents. So we in, in quantum, we have different roles, like quantum ambassador, which is just sharing with you what quantum computing is in the very basic language, I would say, and what IBM is doing, and then sharing about how IBM is developing this ecosystem, having partnering with research institution, partnering with academia, uh, partnering with industry. And in fact, uh, in CES, which happened in uh, January this year, um, I think two of the significant ones that IBM added to its network was Daimler for auto, and uh, that's going to be research around uh, the batteries. And uh, the second one is Delta Airlines to look at the travel fleet-related um, you know, use cases on how it can be solved. So again, optimization, right? So short answer is that uh, brainstorming, getting the organization you know, excited about knowing quantum and then having the ideas around what are the, some of the use cases that can be addressed by quantum. Last question from the floor. Oh, so many. Uh, audience, I don't know. Panel, which one do you want to take? Lady. lady? Okay, where are the lady? Uh, the
Thank you for choosing me. Um, I'm Tornia Sivakumar, and I'm an A-level student. I came here directly Very from school. Cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> my knowledge on quantum technology is highly theoretical. Everything I know is just from books and YouTube. And my question also is a bit theoretical as well. It's also follow-up on the question, what keeps you up at night? Um, something that keeps me up at night is the fact that quantum computing, the processing power is so high that it could potentially crack all of the encryption around the world and even prove to become a national security breach for companies, businesses, and could even infringe um, data policy. And I was wondering, do you think that it's a plausibility or is it just some random fear created by the hype of quantum? Is it a quantum key distribution? But oh. never had the panel answer. <laughs> I was just telling her there's a thing called quantum key distribution. <laughs> that you are you know, looking at different resources, learning about this technology, even at such a young age, and, and I think that's the sort of enthusiasm that we want to see from the community so that we have more people coming in to participate in different ways. Um, and f you know, re with regards to your specific question, uh, it is definitely possible that um, there are quantum algorithms that will be able to break the standard encryption that we have right now. Um, but there are also, other, there are, uh, it, you know, it, so in this case, quantum could be a thread, but at the same time, we can also utilize quantum technology to safeguard all of these uh, encryption schemes. So they are, uh, you know, in the entire field of research called post-quantum crypt cryptography. There is also uh, quantum key distribution, secure quantum communications that are designed to use quantum principles to, um, to encode and, and securely communicate information so that they are then robust against poten potential uh, hacking due to uh, hacking with quantum technologies in the future. So it is definitely an active area of research that's ongoing right now, and I believe that you know, with, with these efforts, we'll definitely be able to mitigate, not mitigate, but we'll be able to, uh, uh, we don't have to worry about this problem uh, in the long run if we continue on this research. <laughs> So um, I want to add the, to this, and I'm not going to get into a product, but we do have a product. <laughs> um, but I do want to say that there are um, standard bodies that are looking at today's current cryptographic standards and how those need to evolve as quantum computing evolves. So I think what we're going to see is today's standards are going to change, and those changes are going to be in order to help organizations really protect against quantum intrusion. So I, I look at, you know, just as quantum computing is evolving, uh, standards are evolving, and there's a lot of work being done there. So I think, you know, change is everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else got anything to add? I, I think they've given an amazing answer, so I, I won't really add to that answer. If I may, though, I would like to ask a question to the audience. Is that okay? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so one of the, going back to the talent, since I, I mean the, there's no title here, but the talent was the title was really about talent, and then we we got swayed a little bit towards applications of quantum computing, which is great. But if you don't mind, I would like to go back to the let me say original topic for a second. So I'll be very honest. One of the big issues that we as a as a company face is that we receive a very large number of applications from people who would like to work with us, but they're usually all very similar in profiles, which is okay, is, is expected, is the birth of a new in industry if you want. But at the same time, I am, I've been failing to find the reason why that should be the case. It goes back to the very beginning, right? There's more than, you know, we can, th there's more than we usually think about it. So maybe a question that I have for you, and especially for the ladies in the audience, if they don't mind answering, that would be really helpful for me to understand. He's been trying to get more females into his company, that's why. But le let, me, let me make a comment on that. That is true, but not because I'm trying to be a hero of gender equality or anything like that. It's an extremely selfish reason. I want to bring together an amazing group of people, and if I only get half of the, pi half of the pie or half of the apple, I am, we are missing out on talents. So if we are not able to speak to the whole talent pool, then it's just not good. 
So this is a, is a very selfish motivation. I want to bring the best people to work with us. And it seems that we are failing to do so, at least to reach out to them. So maybe the question I have for you, and it would be really great if anyone can contribute to that is, can you, can you share a reason, doesn't matter how simple my sound, on why you would feel uncomfortable or maybe unsure or whatever the motivation would be to apply to work for a company like ours or like Cambridge Quantum Computing or any other company that you've seen before? Hi, I'm Junior. I'm a PhD student in NUS. So I'm also doing physics, but even me, I have, I feel not very comfortable to, I don't think I'm ready to apply for a job like uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing or Entropica Labs, because I feel first is that quantum seems to be very difficult to understand, and it's also not very clear what kind of products or services that you are developing, because it's still in very early stage of the company. So it's not very clear. It's very hard to find on the website or any other places to know. So it's not very clear what kind of talents or skills that you're looking for. So most people, we assume that maybe if you have a physics background, PhD background, or computer science background, you want to, you are eligible to apply for the jobs, but other th expertise is not very clear. So I think that might be one of the major reasons. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the other reason would be um, role models and reach out. So in terms of diversity, I would also encourage looking at people like PMETs. I'm running a group called Tech at 50, and it's a real struggle to find people in their, in their 40s, 50s, and 60s doing something which deviates from the, from the norm, which might be a corporate job. It's very easy to find millennials who are doing this. So just visibility and the, the, um, the willingness to, to become a role model, especially if you're from an um, alternative group, you know, which is underrepresented. I take it as a compliment because I'm very close to the, to the <laughs> age group that <laughs> you just mentioned. Yeah, so actually within Tech at 50, we have people age 35 who are coming up to us and saying, well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do in my 40s. You know, it's a very real problem in particularly this society. And like you say, birds of a feather gather together, and, and this can alienate people from coming forward. Yeah. It's just a speculation. Unlike classical computing, where you had anybody who could learn coding and become a programmer, in quantum computing, you are essentially looking for polymaths, uh, merging of at least two disciplines, physics and programming and physics and maths and programming. And it's only been the last 10 years where really physicists have perhaps started looking at machine learning as areas where they can find employment opportunities. You have companies like Stitch Fix hiring physicists from most of the university in the US. Uh, so you have to wait another five years where these new millennials or Gen, Gen Z start coming out of colleges with kind of semi-polymaths people who have expertise in two domains, physics and computing, physics and maths, and then you'll see the kind of profiles that really can do the things that you want done. Because everybody else has essentially specialized in very specific silos and domains, and you, you just have to wait. But if, if I can add to that, <clears throat> is, is a good point, but I, I just say don't be intimidated by, you, you know, then it's very important not to assign labels to people or to skills of the people. Sure, you might have a, a specialization in something that doesn't sound related. Okay, so what? I'm sure if you were able to become a specialist in whatever field you might be a specialist, you will have no problem to, if you want to, only if you want to, not because I'm saying that, to learn uh, whatever skills you need to learn in quantum computing. In, you know, sometimes there is this <laughs> very big misunderstanding uh, people ask me, what do you do? I work in quantum computing. Oh, you must be very intelligent, which drives me nuts. <laughs> because first of all, it doesn't mean absolutely anything. And second, it, it immediately, people immediately create a completely artificial separation between what they, the way they perceive themselves and the way they perceive me. It's like, why? Why? I thought a lady raised her hand for a suggestion just now. Yep. Hello, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think there's two reasons, um, and, and this is just my subjective opinion. I think 
the first reason is being that um, many people uh, actually who aren't in the space of quantum um, computing, they still have the perception that it's still very, very much in the labs. Um, when Denise, you mentioned that there are serial companies um, coming to you wanting to explore this, I was actually quite surprised, and this is super interesting to see that, you know, application of quantum computing is actually very near. So people with um, backgrounds in marketing, um, business development, and those, uh, they don't really realize that their, their skills are actually, could be put into use right now. And the second reason might be uh, really subjective because I, I do work in the venture capital industry. Um, there, I think there might be a concern in funding, and this is um, for, especially for startups, uh, because two years ago there was this talk of quantum winter, there's you know, no funding, um, if, there's, if there couldn't be a breakthrough. Um, so it, it might be a little bit of concern in that field, I'm not exactly sure, but I think the first one is legitimate. Um, people don't realize that, you know, we're actually quite close to bring it into real life. And I think I just want um, to try to answer that as well uh, with an observation. So since I came back to Singapore, uh, I noticed that there's still, uh, there is a problem that's starting to kick in a bit too, so a bit too early in the sense that uh, when I go to outreach in the secondary school, I already hear girls talking about how physics and math are more for boys and maybe chemistry and biology are more for girls. And to me that is somewhat uh, perplexing, right? Like I don't really know uh, why this idea will get propagated, um, it, but I, I think it's, it's there. And very often uh, we have uh, girls, you know, going to the university uh, when they're choosing a discipline to, to continue on as a major, they have these at the, their ba at the back of their minds and end up choosing you know, the field that's conventional perce conventionally perceived to be more suitable for ladies. Uh, and I think that streaming, that almost self-selecting process um, means that when we're hiring at even just the level of upper undergraduates, we already have fewer female candidates uh, graduating with uh, engineering, math, or science degree, um, and that might be causing problems further down the road when it comes to higher level employments, uh, leadership positions in this field in, in general. So I think if we want to change it, we probably have to start much earlier than university level. We have to really go talk to students uh, in a secondary school level mm -hmm. to really change this weird concept of what's, like science doesn't have a gender. Yeah, I right, totally right? agree with you. So I don't know how many of you here are parents how many show of hands? Quite a fair number, well, not many. You more should be parents, lah, huh? Really, we need more people in uh, Singapore. But anyway, recently I attended a talk by Jane Goodall, and she was telling the audience that she has been very lucky in her life because of supportive parents. In particular, she named her mother, uh, who gave her a lot of opportunity and exposure to try different things and not mold her into a certain type of person that she thinks her daughter should be. So as parents, I think we need to take a first step to give our children that opportunity and let them try different things and don't try to stereotype and box them in um, and conscientiously doing that. As the moderator, I have the privilege of asking the last question, which I thought in view that this is a topic around talent. And we have a young lady who's now in her what, 17, 18 years old, right? Um, around this, if you, you know, on the panel, could time travel back to your younger teenage selves, what is the one career advice you give to yourself? Bianca? Um, teenagers, I don't even know whether at that <laughs> time I would think of any career advice. Yeah, because it's a very, um, very interesting age where uh, you're kind of transitioning from, uh, um, you know, getting into a, uh, you don't want to get serious, but yeah, you have to start getting serious about your studies. So if, if I have to travel back, um, I think uh, at that time I'll tell myself to be a little more experimental. So if you try and travel back, um, traditionally there were very few areas of developing the career. It used to be either you would be engineer or you would go into medicine. Right? There were these limited fields, or probably third one after that you will go is commerce at that time. So I think if I had to travel back, I'll say that be a little more experimental, try new things, and um, and then yeah, just continue to learn more and more. Yeah. 
Well, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of a funny story, but um, I'll tell you that uh, my mother's a physicist. And uh, when I was growing up, the last thing I wanted to do was anything with physics. <laughs> um, and so my mother reminds me of that all the time. Um, but I think um, when I was young, I had a very clear idea of where I wanted to go. And there were a lot of opportunities presented to me that I said, no, 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 because I'm going here. And I think I missed a lot along the way. And so I think if I was to go back, I would want to give myself more freedom to experiment and not be just so directed to go, like it was internal, but just so directed to go in one direction and to play around a little bit more. Um, and th that means academically, it, so, yeah. Um, I think for me it would be, you know, do something that uh, you're enthusiastic about and you know, don't worry about the perceptions or the trends and whatnot that's popular. Just do something that you find uh, enjoyable and interesting in the long run and, and ultimately that's going to benefit one way or another. Maybe I would go back and tell myself, you should study medicine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think the point of, um, of being a bit more explorative is a very good one. There is, sometimes there is the tendency, especially in, um, in scientific classes and scientific courses, to box you a little bit. Um, and you also create a little, like, you create a community of people around you who are very similar to you, which is nice because it's supportive, but it can also be a little bit limiting because you very quickly all start to think the same when it comes to you know the future, what you want to, go to do and all of that. Um, I did not want to do a PhD, fun enough, when I finished my studies. I was very happy I finished my studies. Um, I went to work for a bank doing mathematical models, and after a few months I realized that I was missing something, so I went back to university, moved to a different country, and then continued from there. So maybe an advice I would give myself very early on is that there are a lot of opportunities. And just because your title says, whatever it might say, physics, chemistry, it really doesn't matter, uh, there are opportunities, and really one shouldn't be scared of opportunities, which goes back to a lot of what we have been talking about. Titles are okay, but they are just titles. I, titles the only thing that they reflect is your willingness to approach, you know, difficulties in life, nothing else. So really take titles for what they are and not for what sometimes people force you to think they represent. Okay, so with that, we've come to the end of our discussion today. I would like to thank every one of you for turning up despite uh, the gloomy weather and also to thank the panel members on this panel. Thank you. Thank you.